Hi guys, Dr. Ken Norberg again. Uh, my voice is a little scratchy today. Hopefully it isn't going to be that way for the rest of the year, but it might be. Uh, you know all about my voice problems, but anyway, uh, today uh, I want to do a little short piece about uh, one of my whitetail sign guides. Uh, we looked at that last time and I kind of went through them briefly. And uh, I'm not going to follow them in order, just kind of what I think I'd like to do. And the one I want to start with is the card called Activity Cycles. And what it, this card does is tell you when whitetails, the hours are going to be active during the day, during the hunting season, during particular time periods. And a lot of these you know, time periods uh, during the, the rut are much different than, or a lot of them, uh, than at other times of the year, and uh, so forth. It keeps going like that. But there's five, you know, whitetails normally, you know, this is rough, because there's lots of reasons why they can be changed, but generally, this is true, most commonly, except during certain periods of the rut, and other weather conditions. Whitetails begin feeding around 4 in the morning. They get up from the beds, then go drink water, and they'll feed until maybe about 10 o'clock in the morning. Then they'll head back to the beds and to rest and chew their cuds until the middle of the afternoon, maybe as late as uh, an hour and a half before sunset, and they'll continue feeding until uh, about 10 o'clock at night. That's normal. Uh, that's what you should be planning on, unless something is happening that changes that. There are a number of things that changes those hours. So keep that in mind. But even then, there's some exceptions. I'll talk about that. But anyway, let's start with one of the most important of times or periods of, uh, during the whitetail's life in the fall, during the hunting seasons, that can dramatically change hours whitetails will be on the move. And that's the rut, phases of the rut. Now, you see on this card here, yeah, I have these bars across here. And all the, wherever a bar is filled in with dark shading, that's the period when whitetails are active. And you can see on here, see there's, there's five phases to the whitetail rut. There's one, two, three. This fourth one is, is split in two because things are different between the first week of that recovery phase and the second week. Then you get to the final one here. But you can see there are days when whitetails are all active. During, they're active all day during the whitetail run, especially bucks. It doesn't affect does as much, but antlered bucks are affected that way. So, let's look at that. Uh, at the top of the list is what happens during the days of the run? Now that part occurs between September 1st and mid-October. So 45 day long period, long period. And during that period, uh, whitetails feed during pretty much normal hours like we just talked about in the morning and evening and, and rest midday and, and the middle of the night and, and just like I mentioned. But one of the things that's a little different about phase one is that they, uh, during that 45 degree period, all the antler bucks in a square mile, that's a square mile, that's just about three to five antler bucks that live on that square mile, sometimes a couple more, including the yearlings, will all feed together in a special feeding area. And late in the feeding areas, they'll spar and battle with, with each other. And during that period, by the end of it, they all know who the boss buck was. Yes, the one that beat them all. And he's going to be the dominant breeding buck for the following year as a result of that. So sometimes they're, they're in the feeding area a little bit later in the morning because they're not done feeding it. But usually when they get start getting done feeding, uh, uh, it seems like they accidentally bump antlers. And when somebody bumps antlers two bucks, they automatically start battling. That's just you know, a, a ticking another buck's antler with your antler is a challenge to that buck. So, look for them to feed a little, feed a little later in the morning. Now, phase two of the rut, that's the breeding range, 
breeding range establishment phase. And this is the period when there's a frenzy, or there used to be, uh, global warming was beginning to change that, but there's a frenzy of making antler rubs and grouse grapes by all antler bucks. And those are markers of breeding ranges. They're, 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 when a buck makes one of those, he's marking it with urine and musk. And it tells other bucks there, this is my breeding range, and you guys stay out. Well, it's just something they all want to do at the, at the beginning of this particular phase. But by the end of that phase, which lasts two to three weeks before breeding begins in November, it, this goes on 90% of animals cross can make before them. But during that period, uh, there, this dominant breeding buck particularly will be uh, marching along his scrape routes and, and renewing his scrapes, putting more musk and urine on those ground scrapes. Uh, up to 24 hours a day, and hardly getting any sleep, and, and at the same time, he's looking for bucks that he chased off. He chased them out of there. They're going to stay off range uh, temporarily, most of them anyway. The yearlings keep sneaking back, but he's going to be chasing them off. So, during that period, uh, two to, from mid-October until early November, you might see a big buck, a dominant breeding buck, going from his ground scrape to crown scrape on special well-used doe trails in doe ranges any time of the day. So if you're hunting scrapes at that time, you want to be out there all day. You can see that. There's one time you can't afford to not to do that. Now, some of what I just said, you know, I, I felt I just had to tell you why they're busy all day out there in, in certain periods. But a lot of what I'm, some of what I'm saying here, you won't find in the card. You know, there's tips on all of these periods. Uh, the card just doesn't be big enough to handle all that. Uh, you want to be going into detail about the whys and wherefores of all of these changes in hours. Whitetails are active during the day and during the hunting seasons. You have to go to my book. I mean, even my book. It, you can't read this all on one page. There's a lot to know about why and, and where you should hunt and how hard you should hunt and that kind of thing when it comes to this kind of thing. So uh, don't depend on this alone to you know, make it possible for you to be really correct about where you're going to be hunting on from day to day throughout the hunting season. So you got to have the book. And I'm sorry for that. But you know, these cards were made just to provide tips because everybody was asking me questions about this all the time when I started doing seminars about these things. So, anyway, now we got through phase two. Now, phase three uh, is, is the, the primary breeding phase they're on. That's called primary because 85% of does are bred during that period. And during that period, big bucks are with does most of the time. Uh, they're with does in heat most of the time, or they're between does in heat. And sometimes, you know, one day there might be two does in heat in that buck's range, and the next day none. And so he's got a day, he's looking all around, and, and he's looking for other bucks that dare to sneak back, get them out of here, especially those darn yearlings, because they keep wanting to sneak back to mother because they're afraid of that big buck. But anyway, so that time of the year, too, you should spend almost all of your time out in the field somewhere. You, you can hunt in uh, in the morning and the evening where they normally be, but even midday, they're going to be active where, where the doe and heat beds. That buck is going to be with her and they're going to be three, four times during that midday period moving around in that bedding area. So that's a good time. See, it's all black across there. That's the day you want to spend your day in the woods. Come and have lunch if you want, but don't forget about that middle period. This is still one of the best times of year to hunt deer, uh, uh, white tails, especially big bucks. You know, they're most vulnerable then. Okay, so that takes care of that one. Now, the next one I mentioned, that's two parts. Uh, after the after breeding is over, and I, my study here, that primary breeding phase runs right over on November 17th. And the big bucks will always go back to their summer bedding, a real secure place. 
And commonly when they go there, they'll even make friends with other bucks, including yearlings, and encourage them to follow them there and act as a, as a, a guard while that big buck sleeps, because he's really worn out by this time. By this time, from all the fighting with other bucks at this point, chasing around all day and renewing ground scripts, he's a very tired animal. By this time, he could have lost up to 30% of his weight that he had back around the 1st of September. So he's just going to want to rest. And you'll hardly see him move at all, except maybe the first half hour of the day and the last half legal shooting hour of the day, the last legal shooting hour of the day, and always close to where he normally beds in the summer, is that the buck bedding area. But by the beginning of the second week of that period, he's getting to be more active now. And that time, he'll start moving around during the normal feeding hour. He won't do much in the midday, although there's exceptions to that, but he won't go much. Most of it's traveling along his own scrape routes and starting to look for does and heat again. But he's, you know, it will be during those feeding hours. And so there, the normal feeding hours on that bar, the second half of that period, and that's, that's the period. So you hunt there in morning and evening. Don't look for much in the middle of the day on those days, normally. Okay, finally, we're now in the supplemental breeding phase, I call it that. This is a period during which the, the second and third two-week periods of breeding occurs in the whitetail rut. First one, the second one beginning about December 1st, and the third one beginning a few days before uh, January 1st, and extending into the, the first week in January. Well, when you get to that, it's just like phase three of the rut. And uh, in this case, all those other bucks that got chased out are going to be there. So you got lots of bucks running around in that period. But you know, right around Christmas time, all those deer are going to migrate to a wintering area. And so pretty soon they're all in the wintering area. They aren't anywhere where they were before all this happens. But there's all kinds of deer there, does and bucks. And, uh, and there's still some breeding going on. There's lots of excitement out there. You can see bucks, several of them chasing does and that kind of thing. So there again, that part right there, that last part, if you're a bull hunter, late season or muzzleloader, that's where you want to be, near a winter area at the end of the month, or along scrape routes or um, doe feeding areas, in the center, and hunt all day long again. You never know when you're going to see a buck in the middle of the day at that time. Okay, that takes care of that. Now, let's, the next one on my list here is uh, what happens uh, when you have wind. Now, obitos are most active when the wind is calm or very light, like less than well, five miles an hour or less. It's real quiet in the woods and they can hear real well things around. So the best hours when there's wind or very, is when there's no wind or very little wind. And you can see here the activity field, the dark parts, are just the same as up here. And middle of the day there, unless breeding is going on, uh, is the, the uh, it's just like uh, any other normal day when bucks or when whitetails are eating, are feeding during their normal feeding hour. Now, as the wind becomes stronger, it becomes harder for deer to hear danger. And their ears are the only thing provide them a 360 degree protection in the woods. They can hear something coming from every direction. They can only smell things coming from upwind. And they often can't see, especially when they're feeding. They got their head down feeding and they're crunching. And, uh, but they can't see anything. They'll raise their heads and look around, go back. So the ears protect them always, all the time, even when they're sleeping. So anyway, uh, but so when winds are about six to nine miles an hour, it's going to shorten daylight feeding hours. And you see it shortens in about oh, an hour, morning and evening. It shortens that period. So expect that. Uh, it means that maybe you better get out there early on those kind of days because they're going to quit feeding earlier or quit. they will start feeding later in the afternoon. Now, 
when winds are, are uh, 10 to 14 miles an hour, then you start losing even more. You can lose two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon as well. In the afternoon you might end up with only the last legal sheathing hour of the day where, where you can expect to see deer when winds are at 10 to 14 miles an hour. 14 is getting pretty serious. Now, the last part, you don't see anything. It's all, no activity here in the day. When winds exceed 15 miles an hour, except in windy West Texas where the White House there think that 50 mile wind is just calm. <laughs> but here, well, uh, that the wind is causing so much like grass rustling, leaves rustling, branches banging against each other. And all. Boy, it's scary, you know, they can't tell what noise is what out there. It might be something bad coming or just branches, but they'll generally stay in their beds when you got strong winds uh, rather than go out and feed. They'll skip feeding cycles when you have winds like that. And it doesn't matter whether they're strong or gusting. So there, that's something to know. But, like I said, there's, ex there's some exceptions, but not very often. I got all kinds of stories about that. Okay, let's go to the other side of the card. Next one is precipitation. Now, this might surprise you a little bit. So, anyway, uh, here we go. Now, when there's no precipitation, or very light precipitation, like fog is a kind of precipitation, uh, or drizzle, or light snow, or right, uh, light uh, uh, rain, White tails are very active. They like it wet out there. Gee, they can walk without any sound of leaves are wet. Everything. They love it out there. And the, and the, the fog or drizzle or light rain or light snow acts kind of like a, a drape wherever they go. They think, no, they can't see me as well. And that movement of those the raindrops and snow kind of clouds their movements. But they like them. Some of the best the I've ever had was in fog, oh, they love fog. But anyway, so when you have that kind of precipitation light like that, uh, you'll see a lot more activity, as much activity. They might even go, they might even feed till 11 o'clock, 11 3 in the morning in that kind of conditions. Light sleep tower is different. When you have sleep on any amount of sleep, it's pattering on the ground. Uh, they are not there. They start doing that. They're in the bed. And they don't want to be running around because that sleep pollen covers the sound of dangerous predators around them. So they want to be in their safest place in their bedding area. Then, okay. Now, uh, now when you have moderate wind or moderate precipitation, uh, you know, uh, not that heavy stuff like one or two. Uh, inches of snow falling, I know, or that kind of, that's pretty heavy. But my white tails can be fairly active during that time, but not quite as active as they'll be when the, when the precipitation is light or there is no light. So there again, you might lose half hour to an hour during the day, in the morning and the evening because of that. But expect that. And then, when you got heavy rain falling, real heavy rain, and like heavy snow, when it's coming down like one to two inches an hour in the winter, we get that stuff in Minnesota every now and then during our hunting seasons. A couple of years ago, we had a hip deep snow <laughs> overnight, and it was still coming down like crazy on opening morning, and that was there was nothing moving. When you get the first heavy snow of winter, white tails will generally remain in their beds all during the time of snowing and not move again until. The first night after the snow finally ends, uh, 24 hours after the first snow fly, heavy snowfall ends. And heavy can be six to eight inches or more. That's heavy, the first one. After that, that won't bother them so much. You can get another foot of snow two or two, three days later. And they aren't going to wait 24 hours to be feeding again. So anyway, but during that period, there's nothing moving. And uh, so expect that. And that probably is more sure than just about any other weather condition you can imagine. So, anyway, 
Uh, so you get blank there. And then uh, this bottom line is all white. That's sleep. No, you got sleep. You're going to not see anything there either. So there you go on that. That's something to expect. Those are good things to know. You know, it might be a good day. Well, let's stay in camp and play cricket today at noon or something. Because there's not going to be anything out there. I remember one time we did that. My son Ken decided to go out there anyway, and we were all having fun playing cribbage. And pretty soon he comes back to the tent and he says, uh, uh, Something happened to my bullet. You know, there's no more, I don't know, my, my shell here, there's no more bullet in it. Said, well, what kind of a stupid thing is that? I said, and I looked at it, and I said, You got one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, he, you know, sometimes that happens, but in this case, a, a white cedar tree had fallen into heavy winds, and those deer were crowded around that thing in the middle, middle of the day, and they got a buck from that. So. Okay, next one on here is air temperature. Now, air temperature can have a real dramatic effect on whitetail activity cycles. Uh, up where I hunt, by November or by October 15th, all of our deer have grown their winter coats. And those winter coats are good for 45 below zero. I mean, that's a pretty heavy coat. And what that means is if, if, if the temperature is unusually warm, you know, uh, like, oh, 50 to 70 degrees during the day, they aren't going to move. They don't want to be moved even walking around feeding when it's that warm, when they have their winter coats. And so you can, if you, if you didn't get to your stand till sunrise, and then you got that usual little half hour, you got to wait before any deer that were around decide it's okay to start moving again. By that time, the feeding cycle could be over. You know, when it's like that, most air feeding be done at night or in the early morning hours, before it starts getting warm. So the morning feeding cycle, when you got unusually warm temperatures after, uh, uh, I'll say, uh, in October or November, you aren't going to see many days. It's so boring, it's like watching paint dry when it's like that. And that's almost certain when you got that kind of temperature. One of the ways global warming is changing things out there. So, but when it's like that, uh, you got to hunt early in life. That's the only chance, you know, like the last hour of the day and the first couple hours of the morning. That's your best chance to see a deer when it's like that. Now, when temperatures are like, say, uh, 20, between 20 and 40 degrees during the day, you know, up and down below freezing, that temperature 40 is okay. White tails are really active. They like it that, you know, it's a nice day for them with their winter coats on. You know, so they're nice and active when you got temperatures in that range. But when temperatures start dropping down below zero, especially if there's any wind, then things start changing again. That you know, The time that they're going to be moving around will be shortened. Right? You get temperatures, uh, like it says in my card, uh, 10 to 19 degrees, uh, much colder, you know, to get below that 20 degree range, you'll start seeing shortening in the daylight hours that white tails are on the moon. If it's that cold all day, it's gonna, they're going to be spending more time in their bed staying warm. They might feed real more quickly in the morning, but they'll end their daylight feeding periods quicker when it's like that. Uh, when you get down to zero and five, fewer deer. There will be deer out there, but not as many. And then uh, finally, when you get down well below zero, you can be out there all day, all day, especially if there's any wind, and not see a deer. But again, there are some exceptions. And usually when there's an exception, a big buck is the one that's make it, doing that. So anyway, keep that in mind. Well, yeah, except there's a number of them. Uh, they, what they tell you is that no matter what, you should hunt anyway. <laughs> and us farmers do that. We, we go out there knowing, oh, geez, I could probably not see a thing there. We're going to freeze out there today. But we go anyway. Because once in a while, there's an exception. But most times there isn't. So, 
if you're getting old like me and you think, oh, geez, I know, I might be missing something, but I probably won't see a dead darn <laughs> this afternoon, so I'm going to stay in camp this afternoon. Anyway, it's the exceptions, and there's some really notable ones that I, I've never forgotten, are all in my book. I talk about those, so I can't put all that on a card like this. So. These are tip cards. Now, the last one in here is uh, Effects of Moonlight and Hunters, the two together. There's been a lot of controversy over this over the years, but Honestly, I put so much time and effort into studying this over the years that I can't agree with anybody who disagrees with this. I just can't. People will argue with me. One guy wrote a whole book about this. Then he talked about how many hours they did this or that. I think it kind of depends on how you want and where you're at. Look, if you're a guy who walks around the woods all day, I like to sneak and poke around. You're going to be disturbing deer during middle day, middle hours of day that when they're normally resting. And so what that's going to mean? I mean, you might see deer moving any time during the day. That's what's going to happen. But most of the time, you aren't going to get close to a mature buck that way. And another thing is, when deer can't have safe rest areas, during the hunting season, they'll abandon their ranges. And older bucks will probably abandon them, if they have to abandon them, they're probably gone for the hunting season. So that's pretty destructive. But the point is, if you went that way or you're making drives, you think, well, you don't have to worry about this stuff. We see deer running around all day long where we hunt. Well, they might do that for the next first or two days of the hunting season. But they're going to get pretty scarce after that. So don't base your opinions on that if that's what you hunt. If you're a stand hunter though, they're going to stay with you all hunting season. Unless you shoot at them and miss and they run away. But you do things properly when you're stand hunting, they're going to stay with you all season. Then they're going to be doing what this card says. And you're allowing them to do that. But they're going to stay there. Your chance of getting deer during these dark periods on this chart here are going to be really great and dependable. Now, how about dependability like that? You say, oh, you can't count on one deer are going to be in any one place at one time. Well, you can if you hunt them properly. So keep that in mind. Well, let's get back to the to this moonlight. Now, this is the truth. As I, this is one of the things I've studied so long and so well. I can say this is the way it is. During a hunting season, not at other times, you, know, you can drive by a field and you deer and all, things just don't add up like they did through there. But when you've got moonlight, when you're during the hunting season, even when there's stand hunters out there, but not quite as dramatic. But uh, when you've got moonlight, it can be a quarter moon, a little thin thing, or a full moon. When you got moonlight in the morning, you get up in the morning and go out to your stand site going in. Oh, it's all dark. You're bright moonlight out. And you don't even have to see the moon. The moon can be above thick clouds. The clouds are all illuminated. And all white underneath there. When you got that, and you have aggressive hunters, people who walk around and make drives like that, uh, you won't. Pretty soon, within a day, two days, you'll stop seeing deer in the morning. They'll already be in their beds by first light. When you got moonlight in the evening and you got aggressive hunting going on in your area, for the first couple of days, you might see deer moving at any time. But after those couple of days, maybe three at the most, you won't hardly ever see any deer. At mature white tails, you might see ponds in here, like but you won't really see any of them moving in the evening. They won't get out of their beds until it's dusk. You know, and start moving around. So, uh, moonlight can have a real, real dramatic effect that way. Now, if you've got, there will be days, I hate those, where you got moonlight in the morning and the evening. 
And days like that where you have aggressive hunter, you probably won't see a deer all day. I just hate that. Just hate that. But there's a time. Every 28 days, there's a seven day period. I call it the dark of the moon. The calendar's called new moon. There's no moon in new moon. Uh, where there's no moonlight all day long. And that's the very best time to hunt. Whitetails are most active during the dark of the moon, that whole week. We love to hunt during the dark of the moon. We check our calendars, uh, the predictions of sunrise, sunset, moonset, and all that kind of thing, well before every hunting season. Now, all day, that dark of the moon period, but we got that period in our hunting scene. Now, if it's the last week in the hunting scene, we got to be there because that's the time to hunt, best time. Have to go back up there or stay up there. Uh, or, here's another time. If you have no moonlight in the morning, don't waste your morning hours. Get out there early. Because that's the best time. If you have no moonlight in the evening, well, you've got a good chance of seeing one during the last hour, hour and a half, legal shooting hour of the day. Be out there, no moon like me. Hunt that, that's like no moon, you know, for a half day anyway. So keep that one, if you got Where you have moonlight, that's gonna, that's gonna lessen your chance of seeing the But when you have no moonlight, whether it's morning, afternoon, or all day, you're hunting, uh, success, if you're hunting properly, will be much better. Oh. How about that for a card, huh? Look, you had something like that in your camp and have it hanging in your, in your tent. Like we, we have these things on our table all the time. And you look at that and say, oh, geez, i got to be out there all day today. Or, oh, boy, I better get up at 4 in the morning because, you know, and especially, it's supposed to wind, it's supposed to get stronger at 10 miles an hour by 10 o'clock. So i got to be out there early by 10 o'clock, no moon that morning. That's my best time to be out there. Or you might say, well, they're breeding. Or the, the bucks in this recovery phase, you know, or in this bedding area, you probably maybe even don't know where it is. But one of the things I said, well, it's going to be active in the feeding. And it doesn't say this on the card, but when that buck feeds during that recovery period, he, he will almost always follow in the trail of the nearest doe and his young, where they feed. They kind of act like radar. Ahead of the buck, because you know, he's not sure he's tired. Let the let the doe figure out whether there's danger ahead. He might follow just in her tracks, skating along with you, or he might follow within sight of her. But he's taking keeping track of sounds and making sure. Here's that doe snark all one getting out of here, or he's, he smells the danger scent that's emitted by a doe's tarsal glands when she becomes alarmed along her trails. Sit there. It smells like ammonia. He smells like, oh geez, I'm gonna hit that, that door has been radar for him during that period. So uh, keep that in mind, but that's a good place to hunt box during that period. The, the, the current favorite feeding area of a doe was young. Uh, during the during oh the last week in November <laughs> is a great time to hunt big bucks. In that, in that great place to do it. And you learn all that from cards like that, that this card. So this kind of check, you know, this demonstrates well, how valuable these things are. And so, well, again, like I said, I don't really put so much on it. Yeah, you can imagine, uh, you know, we're checking weather forecasts and all those things. Imagine, here's the day before, right up to, you know, I was going three days early. Imagine how we're going to feel if we see on Everything lining up in this car, gee, there's uh, calm winds and uh, 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 those are going to be in heat. And uh, the uh, no precipitation, or be a little light, they uh, light precipitation, uh, maybe fog even. And temperatures in between 20 and 40 degrees and uh, uh, no moonlight during the first week. We, oh man, we won't be asleep at night. <laughs> thinking about opening more. This is about the best you can have, you know, for for deer hunting. So, well, 
You know, one thing too. My son John just informed me I'm speaking top more softly. You know why? Yesterday I got new hearing aids. <laughs> I can't believe all the sounds I've been missing. And now I'm talking softer. Anyway, he is remind me, talk louder. <laughs> so I'll do that. Anyway, if it, I'll say it again. If you like what you heard today, and I can't imagine you didn't, you know, uh, do me the favor of subscribing to my YouTube channel. Poking on that subscribe red button down below here. And another thing I've learned is just as important. Give me, put, click on that thumbs up symbol as well. You know, it just take a second. But it means a lot to me. And uh, because uh, it'll make it more economically feasible for me to keep doing this. You know, you look at all those YouTube presentations I've made. That's taking a lot of time. When you do that, you're doing me a favor, and it's important to me because it'll help to pay for all the time and effort I've been putting into making all these YouTube presentations. Look at them all. There are many people on the internet doing all this and we're providing any of the kind of information, good quality stuff based on scientific studies. So you're, you're getting the real thing here. You're learning things that other hunters will never learn unless they come to this and uh, start looking at these. So do that for me. That's, uh, no, you can't live on Social Security. <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to make extra money in my old age, so that helps. And this is a fun way to do it. Nobody wants to hire an 84 year old man, but this is a grand way for me to make a little extra money. So do that, will you please? And I really will appreciate that. So that's a bit. That's it for today. And uh, I'm glad you came. To, I'm glad you uh, took the time to watch this today, and I'll see you again soon. Bye now. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.